today and to have the opportunity to speak about my grandfather, Leo Mascioli. <laughs> Difficult as it's going to be, I'm going to try to summarize his life from his beginnings in Italy and throughout his career in Northern Ontario. The history of the porcupine is a story of the epic struggle of men and women of immense courage and faith. It's a story about individuals who tramped through bush, sand, swamp, paddled canoes, rode horses on narrow bush trails, and lived in the most primitive and uncomfortable conditions. And it's a story of how, through sheer force of character, they chose to tame this brutal wilderness. My grandfather, Leo Mascioli, was one of those individuals. He was born in 1876 in a poor, isolated village in Italy. From a very young age, he imagined new worlds with greater opportunities. And at the tender age of 10, he convinced his parents to allow him to travel to America with a family friend who posed as his father. Landing in Boston, Leo worked at various odd jobs, a boot black, a newspaper boy, a dishwasher, a ditch digger. At the age of 19, Leo by then had developed a small following of men who liked working with him. So when he heard talk of free transportation for men willing to go to Canada to work, he had no trouble convincing his gang to go there with him. They ended up in Nova Scotia on a six-month contract to work in the steel mills. Afterwards, they made their way to Glace Bay, where Leo contracted himself, along with his crew, that was about 100 now, to work in the coal mines. Three years later, in 1898, Leo acquired the contract for himself and his men to erect Marconi's first wireless towers in St. John's, Newfoundland. For two years, they worked side by side with Marconi, and in 1901, the first transatlantic wireless radio transmission was finally received. This was groundbreaking technology, and Leo must have been pleased to be part of that. In 1904, he returned to his hometown of Coculo, Italy, for a much-earned rest and married his childhood friend, Raffaella. When he returned to Canada two years later, he headed straight to Cobalt, which was in the midst of a huge silver boom. In 1908, while contracting for the O'Brien Mine, Leo and his crew of about 150 built the Cobalt Haley Berry tram line. It proved to be a lucrative project. For one summer's pay, he and his men received $72,000, a great deal of money at that time. Still under contract with the O'Brien Mine, Leo sent a crew of men into the Porcupine in 1908 to prospect what would become the Hollinger Mine. They found nothing and returned to Cobalt. But just one year later, in 1910, gold was discovered in the Porcupine and Leo made the trek into the camp. It was a journey he would never forget. At that time, the train only went as far as Matheson, approximately 40 miles from Timmins. After taking the train to Matheson, Leo walked the rest of the way to reach the camp. It was during the depths of winter, and he would never forget how cold he felt. Years later, he was known to wear long underwear at the height of summer because he said he never wanted to be cold again. <laughs> Leo began to work for the Hollinger Mine and eventually started contracting men to the mine. He contracted about 400 men to work at the mine and sponsored many others and their families to come from Italy with the promise of work. He quickly realized that getting supplies into the porcupine camp was a challenge and immediately decided to open a general store and bakery. Not long after that, he realized the mining camp needed some entertainment. So he started showing movies in the back of a store. Before the first talking movies, a player piano, equipped with drums and pipe organ effects, played along to accompany the silent movies. Using kitchen chairs for seating and charging 25 cents for admission, he arranged for a film operator to run the film from a crammed 2x4 booth above the front door. The store was instantly transformed into the Empire Theater, Timmins' first movie house. 
It was housed in three different locations over the years, and although it only sat 150 people, the theater was packed every night. There was also apparently a popular dance hall below the floor of the Empire Theater. Jean Colombo, who managed the theater, and another fellow would play the piano and violin before the movie started. And as soon as the movies ended, the men would run downstairs to the dance hall and start playing and entertaining all over again. Because of its location below the theater floor, the dance hall developed the name The Underworld. It became so popular that Jean's little duo eventually grew to a 25-piece orchestra. In addition to playing music, they put on shows with local talents that were a great success. The Empire Theater was located where the current Seniors Community Center is on 3rd Avenue, and the stage in the basement is what remains of the old dance floor. Leo went on to build the Goldfields Theater in 1924, and the Palace Theater in 1936. In their day, people considered both these theaters the most modern of their time. The Palace Theater in particular was known for its luxurious decor, comfortable seating, and perfect acoustics. Leo spared no expense to create a state-of-the-art theater and employed engineers to ensure its quality. He also built smaller theaters in Schumacher, which is now the Croatian Hall, South Porcupine, Ansonville, New Liskert, and he ran the theaters in Cochrane and Kapuskasi. The best first-run movies would always play first at the Palace, and then in the other towns. Midnight movies were screened for the miners who worked the afternoon shifts, and the theaters also catered to amateur shows, stage shows, and the showing of newsreels. Leo also ran the Broadway Theater and the Carche Theater in Timmins, which attracted budding talent like Sammy Davis Jr., who was only 14 when he performed there. In 1924, Leo Burke built the first of the Empire Hotels in Timmins. The original Empire only offered 25 rooms, sorry, 75. But over the years, and two editions later, both the ladies' and men's beverage room were added, along with 45 more rooms for a total of 120. The hotel offered 80 of those rooms with baths, and all had a sink with hot and cold water. In 1928, he built the second Empire Hotel in North Bay. Of the small hotels in Northern Ontario, it was the most modern and best furnished. It was also luxuriously decorated. The dining room housed an orchestra shell and was ornately appointed with large crystal chandeliers and highly decorative plaster work on the ceiling and walls. There was also a barber shop, a drugstore, and large comfortable waiting rooms. All the guests were soundproofed and included a telephone and reading lamps. All offered the same sinks with hot and cold water, and some, but not all, offered baths. At the time, both these hotels were considered very modern and luxurious with the amenities that they offered. Things we take so much for granted today. Both the Empire and Timmins and the Empire and North Bay were well located for their time, both near the railroad station and in the center of town. In 1930, Leo added the Lady Laurier Hotel in Timmins to his businesses. He bought an existing hotel and did extensive renovations to it. It was considered a low price but comfortable hotel, and it is now home to Ross Pope and Company. In the same year, Leo and another businessman, John Carnavalli, bought the Timmins Arena from the Hall in Germain. People used the arena both in winter and in summer. They offered everything from hockey games, to boxing, flower shows, and bazaars. It wasn't their most profitable venture, as it cost more to operate than the proceeds that were earned from the events. I can't overlook another of Leo's successful businesses, the excitement for the porcupine camp. Some of the patrons were entertained themselves and the rest of the clientele regularly by playing the piano and the violin and Pete himself often joined in on the accordion and they'd play for hours. While he'd keep a close eye on his establishment, it was nothing for him to join in on the fun 
that the men were having. Jean Colombo was involved with Leo and Tony's businesses since their very beginning. As I mentioned earlier, he was the manager of all the theaters in the Mastioli chain, as well as a prolific violinist and pianist who would often entertain the theater audiences before the movies. We also know that his love for entertainment didn't stop there because he helped make the underworld dance hall a memorable place. Leo came to Canada for a better life than the one that he had in Italy. With an unwavering faith and a strong work ethic, he wasn't afraid to go after opportunities that presented themselves. He, and sometimes other investors, risked everything to build and develop businesses in the North that hadn't existed before. Leo became successful, but he saw that it was just as important to give back to the community that had given him his chance for a better life. His charitable works were numerous, but have remained largely unknown. To name a few, on countless nights, Leo turned over the theater receipts to a good cause or organization. He often treated the children from the Children's Aid Society to free movies. He also offered free use of his theaters to the local service clubs for their meetings or events. When the Timmins Daily Press building burned to the ground, Leo gave them free use of one of the theater basements until they built their new facilities a year later. He did the same when St. Anthony's Church burned down in 1936. To continue to offer regular services to its congregation, Leo offered them free use of the theater for a year. When the church was rebuilt, he completed the sidewalks around the new church for free and donated a great deal of construction material and labor for free. He made generous cash donations yearly to all the churches, the French, the English, and the Italian, and again often donated free construction materials. He donated the land for the construction of the Italian church, as well as its church bells. He also assisted these churches by donating the free use of land for athletic purposes for the youth in their congregations. This allowed the churches to develop and offer athletic programs to help keep the youth off the streets. Leo belonged to and offered financial support to many of the local service clubs the Knights of Columbus, the Kiwanis, the Canadian Legion, the Children's Aid Society, the Salvation Army, and others. He rarely attended meetings, but was always in the background to offer support. When the celebrations of King George V and the Governor General's visit to Timmins took place, Leo and Tony built patriotic floats for the loyalty parades on their own dime. Despite their importance, hospitals were often neglected in those days. At his own expense, Leo furnished hospital rooms and operating rooms at both St. Mary's Hospital and Porcupine General Hospital. He was known to often pay the hospital bills for people who couldn't afford them, and frequently donated free construction work to the hospitals. Knowing everything that I've just talked about, makes it even more puzzling that Leo and Tony were arrested and interned during World War II, along with hundreds of other Italian Canadians. When Mussolini allied with Hitler and declared war against France and Britain on June 10, 1940, thousands of Italian Canadians were immediately declared enemy aliens by the Canadian government. Over 600 were interned in Petawawa, Kananaskis, and Fredericton, because they were viewed as a threat to national security. Leo and Tony were among the men interned from Timmins. The others who were not interned, and which included women and children, were photographed and fingerprinted and had to report regularly to the RCMP. They were required to ask permission, even if they wanted to leave town, just briefly. Wives whose husbands were interned were left with little or no means to care for their families. Bank accounts were seized and frozen by the government, and a monthly allowance was doled out until the funds ran out. 
All those in turn were arrested, but never charged with a crime, yet deemed a security threat. Throughout the 1930s, small fascist groups arose in communities across Canada. These were strongly encouraged by the Canadian-Italian conflict and promoted as Italian social clubs, as well as places to network for possible employment. Italian Canadians were ne never led to believe that the groups were political in nature. Throughout the 30s, fascism, fascism was not viewed as subversive. But this changed in an instant when Italy allied with Hitler. A lot of the Italians in turn were or had been members of the movement. For many years, Tony had assisted new Italians arriving in Timmins with paperwork required by the Canadian-Italian consulate. He became an intermediary between the Italian consulate and new Italian immigrants who couldn't read or write English. Leo, while not involved in the same way as Tony, was also well known in the Italian community. When the Italian consulate wanted to establish a fascist group in Timmins, it seemed a natural choice to approach Leo and Tony to help them recruit members. Leo had zero time. He was far too busy running his businesses, or zero interest as well. Tony at one point, though, did agree to assist the Secretary of the North Bay Fascia by hosting a meeting with him to try to stimulate interest in the Italian community. Interest was poor. Most men didn't want to pay the annual dues of one dollar. A few signed up, but again, all including Tony, were led to believe that this would be beneficial for social and business reasons. Two years later, in 1936, Tony was approached a second time by the North Bay Secretary to stage another meeting, but this time the entire community was invited. Once again, attendance was poor, and after that, interest petered out entirely. When Leo and Tony returned to Italy in 1938 because their mother was dying, they were advised by the Italian Consul General to sign and take fascist membership cards with them to Italy under the impression that it would make travel in Italy easier. Trusting this advice, they did so only to discover that these cards were useless to them. However, this was viewed with great suspicion, and their membership cards, along with Tony's limited and innocent involvement, were the reasons for their arrest. In the end, they and all other Italian attorneys were found innocent and released. This left its mark on the families affected. Hatred against Italians sprang up everywhere. People lost their jobs just for being Italian and were often denied employment elsewhere for the same reason. The government seized the properties and businesses of many internees and sold them off for peanuts. When these men were released, they returned home to nothing. This was probably the greatest injustice of all. My father, Dan, who was only 27 years old when Leo and Tony were interned, had a difficult time convincing the government to let him run their businesses. Eventually, the government conceded but audited the businesses on a regular basis. We were one of the fortunate families to maintain our properties, but at only 27, my dad became responsible for all operations and hundreds of employees overnight. At the same time, he was working very hard to build a defense to get Tony and Leo released. It must have been horribly stressful for him not knowing... Despite his business acumen and boundless energy, Leo lived a simple life. He disliked the spotlight, and he lived simply in his home on 3rd Avenue. He owned a Packard, but preferred to drive his Chevy. It appears that his only indulgence was clothing. He enjoyed fishing, playing Italian cards, and cooking. His interest in the news of the day only interested him in terms of how it affected business trends. As far as his character goes, I've had to rely on personal impressions from other family members because he died before I was born. I understand that he could be quite formidable he demanded a lot of himself, and he gave a lot of himself, and expected others to do the same. 
Leo was a perfectionist. When someone let him down, he would tell them off. And he was known to fire men in the heat of the moment, only to be puzzled why they weren't at work the next day. <laughs> he'd call them up and say, where were you today? You didn't come to work. Then he'd go on to say that he didn't mean it, he was just upset at that moment, and to get back to work. Leo could be stirred, but we know from his charity work that he also had a big heart. Leo's life was a success built on hard work, but he had his own share of hardships and obstacles. Having lost his wife at the young age of 35 and his eldest daughter at the even younger age of 20. Perhaps he threw himself even deeper into his work to forget the pain. It will always boggle my mind to think of the blind faith, courage, and perseverance that kept the first men and women of Timmins and the Porcupine going. They never gave up, and they continued to believe that within this harsh land lay a brighter future. Thank you.